amigos. Hola, hola. Hi, bienvenidos. Be welcome this afternoon here in my home and city, Lima, Peru. Muchas gracias for your participation. Thank you so much for coming to Lima today uh, in this well, from home lecture that I'm going to be doing based on a tour I had earlier today uh, where we went with my friends from Hegel to a monastery of Franciscans. So, well, amigos, today we are going to have, in this occasion, from my home, the opportunity of live again that experience through some images I have with me and also, uh, well, telling you a little bit of the story of this convent. Um, so, well, thank you so much for coming today. Hola, Miguela. Hello. Hello, amiga. Hi. Hello, Jan. Hello, and thank you so much for, for coming. Hi, Dema. Hello. Hi. Thanks for visiting Lima again. Um, if this is your, your first time with me, well, thank you so much for coming to Lima. Thanks for uh, taking this tour, this uh, lecture. And well, I really appreciate your, the time you're giving me uh, this afternoon or maybe evening or maybe morning time, depending on where you are. So I really hope we can learn a lot together about how used to be life within the, the convents uh, in this part of the world, in, in this uh, part that was called the New World, right, uh, during the colonial times. Um, today we're going to have the chance of living again a, a little bit of, well, through pictures, the experience we had earlier visiting the convent of the shoeless monks, the convent of the Descalzos, uh, which is um, none other than the Franciscan order, uh, we have here different convents in, in Peru, different convents in Lima. Some of them are older than others. So the convent we're going to be visiting virtually today through these pictures uh, is a convent that is still exists, uh, that is a museum. And this museum is excited to receive you virtually uh, as well. Uh, also, is, so we're going to be going again to this convent soon uh, and I hope you can come with me also. It, it will be an amazing experience. So uh, before we start, uh, as, as you know already, we are here in my house here in Lima, Peru. This is a, a lecture star style event uh, and all your questions are of course welcome. Please don't be shy with your questions. I am not a historian, I am a tour guide. Uh, and my specialty is uh, pre-Hispanic and also colonial history. I am in love of, of these periods of the history of Peru and as well also the early Republican times, the times when uh, we became the country, uh, you know nowadays, Peru, uh, but also the time when finally we consolidated our, our uh, identity as Peruvians, right? So uh, through my events and tours, I try to take you to different parts of Peru, different parts of Lima also, through lectures or in uh, city tours in the city. So, well, I think the group is already here. All the group is ready. So give me a thumbs up if you are ready for uh, this uh, event. Uh, for starting this event. Uh, gracias, Queen. Gracias, Michaela. Excellent. It's good to have you here, by the way. And well, let's start with this event. So in today's occasion, <laughs> gracias, Larry. In today's occasion, we are going to talk about how used to be life in the colonial times within the convents. Oh, we're going to learn about um, well, the reasons also why sometimes people used to end up in, in convents in this part of the world. Um, I'm sure that if you come, for example, from Europe, this, these stories will be at some point familiar because, um, well, the reasons why people uh, decided to, to embrace a life within a monastery was pretty much the same uh, in terms of, you know, the, the purpose of, of finding a closer connection with God, serving God, right? But um, Peru also was a country of saints, 
people who were born in Peru or came to Peru early in their lives and um, were able to find their way into sanctity right? through the actions they did uh, uh, during their lifetime. In most of the cases, very short period of life they had here in Peru uh, because, well, uh, many of them died early, right? So was it a possibility for poor people to get education as well? Yes, Michaela, indeed, indeed. Um, education was something neglected to common people, right? As long as you could be, you know, a wealthy person, afford for that education, right? You could access, right, to, to documents, to libraries. So one of the reasons why people ended up in convents was because there they could have the chance of learning about things, right? Um, so indeed, Miguel, indeed. Uh, well, so uh, this uh, event today is inspired in a documentary made for, uh, by a Peruvian um, channel, uh, a, a television uh, a channel a, that is called the number seven television, Canal Siete. And um, they have wonderful documentaries, unfortunately all in Spanish only. So um, I will be using sometimes these documentaries for you to, uh, for example, go deeper into certain details. But if you want to practice Spanish, try to go to uh, the documentaries, for example, from, uh, a, let's say, Museo Sin Limites, for example, which is the, the one you can see here, right, if you want to practice your Spanish. Okay, so before we start, um, just let me give you uh, some information about uh, the importance of the Franciscans in, in Peru. Um, the Franciscan order is the second uh, order that arrived to this territory. The first order was the Dominican, right? So we had Dominicans, Franciscans, Mercedarians, uh, we had Augustinians and Jesuits in that order arriving to Peru. But the first two orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, came during the time of the conquest the conquest of this territory, which means the period uh, when these territories were gained uh, from the hands of the indigenous, right? So it was a time of big faith also among the, the ones that joined these orders and wanted to come to, to the new world to evangelize. So it was the evangelization who led them into these territories. And the Dominicans and the Franciscans were excellent for this work because even since, you know, the, the very life of St. Francis of Assisi, as a man who, by the way, his biography is really interesting, a man who gave all from him to the others, that he not ask anything for him. A man that, you know, found, uh, first of all, you know, in, in his sinful life, you know, of, of many, many pleasures because he was a womanizer. He was a, a, a man that was very handsome, a rich man. He found nothing, nothing in that world that, that really made him happy. He found it all when he renounced to to the pleasures of, of the flesh, right? Uh, so St. Francis of Assisi became an emblem uh, a symbol for many men like him who uh, were not feeling satisfied with uh, the the world, the, the, the world that you know, the, the, the things, the common things, right, that, that people can receive in the world, right? So I'm just showing you here some information if you don't know who San Francis of Assisi or in Spanish Francisco de Assis. Mm -hmm. So information that you can find easily, of course, you can uh, uh, recognize this is a, a little extra from Wikipedia, right? Um, so Francis of Assisi, of course, never came to Peru, but the Franciscans uh, came to Peru, came to these territories, and uh, they look, they search for a model uh, of, of life th the, similar to the one lived by Francis of Assisi in this territory. Uh, also quite interesting no? to imagine that, yes, initially uh, the conquistadors were not wealthy people, were not rich people. Uh, they made wealth here in this territory indeed. That's also one of the reasons why they ended up killing each other. That's the case, for example, of uh, Francisco Pizarro and Diego de Almagro, uh, two Spaniards who finally they fought until their death, 
Oh. Um, but later on, the, the court from Spain started to arrive to Peru. Peru became a land of wealth, a land of, uh, let's say, of beautiful architecture, uh, a land of um, also scenes, right? Because the more wealth you have, the more sinful sometimes you can get. And this is why the Franciscans, which initially built a convent uh, very, very close to the main square of Lima. I, I, I'm sure some of you have been with me in the downtown of Lima in some occasions, right? Very close to the main square of Lima, we virtually visited the church of the Franciscans and the convent of the Franciscans. Oh? Uh, the convent and the church, which are very beautiful, which are also museums, are in the center of the city. Right. Um, so those churches, uh, church and monastery were built few years after the arrival of the conquistadors. So the initial period of construction of those church, of those church and monastery are the year 1541. But there was a group, a segment of Franciscans, which were looking for a more extreme lifestyle. And that's why they ended up soliciting a monastery or a convent, sorry, that would be outside the city. So this is how this convent appeared, right? This is the convent of the uh, Shules, uh, Convento de los Descalzos, the convent of the Shules. Uh, why Convento de los Descalzos? Why Shules? Well, this is because... Uh, this this branch of the Franciscans, with what, which were looking into more extreme lifestyle, uh, when they used to come from the from the city center, which was in in that direction, right? They used to come walking, walking, walking to here to their monastery. Um, th sometimes they wore barefoot, or they used to just wear sandals. And because the robes were very very long, people believed they were barefoot. Sometimes it was like that. Sometimes it was because they were just wearing sandals, but they embrace a more extreme lifestyle, right? So this is also very, very interesting. So anyways, we can see here the space that occupies in this moment the convent of the Shules. And I'm taking today the example of, of this convent because I think it's, it's in a way it's more extreme also. And I'm, I, I'm sure you're going to find it really interesting too as a, as a picture uh, of how life in the convent used to be in the old days, right? So this convent in particular, which still is occupied, it is um, very big. It has 12 cloisters, but only four of those cloisters are open to the public, to the general public. Right. So uh, when we get inside this convent, oh, we come through here and it has a church. Of course, this is a church for the community. Right. Uh, by the way, the convent is known as the Convento de Nuestra Señora de Los Ángeles, uh, the convent of Our Lady of the Angels. Right. So uh, this was the church of the convent. Right. And the cloister entrance is through here. So this is the first patio. We have another patio over here, another patio here, and another in this section, right? These are the ones that are open to the public. The rest are not open to the public. They are private, meaning that still nowadays we have uh, monks that live here. But the number is not so big. How many monks do you think are living nowadays in this beautiful and huge house. Please let me know in the comments if you would like. And by the way, in this section, we had a retreat area, a zona de retiro, a retreat. So meaning that when, for example, a religious um, order or a church or a parish is organizing, for example, uh, first communions 
or uh, let's say some uh, retreat saw for the Catholic community, you know, and it's needed, you know, these this weekends right? or, or pre, pre-marital, I think also, uh, there are some, I, I don't remember, <laughs> it's been a long time ago. So, well, uh, the, the church can organize these spaces, right, to be rented, right, for, for the community, for these retreats, spiritual retreats. I hope I'm saying it in the right way. Uh, so, uh, well, let's see the numbers, the estimates. Ah, interesting. Michaela says 25, Andrea 2, Queen 20. Uh, yes, that's right, Liz, that's right. <laughs> you know already the answer. <laughs> Larry 30. So, well, let me tell you, my friends, uh, in this occasion, nobody uh, won. <laughs> but the number is very close, actually. Uh, the number is 12. We just have 12 monks living here in this uh, monastery, right? This is a Franciscan monastery. It's still active, but nowadays this monastery is more like a retirement house because uh, we have uh, elderly uh, Franciscans only living here. Uh, so well, now you know the sections that are museum, right? So... Um, well, here we have the uh, a view, a picture uh, from the uh, beginnings of the 20th century of a beautiful park that is the entrance into the, uh, the convent, right? So remember that Lima, the, the Lima of the colonial times, the colonial period, uh, we can say it is since the uh, 16th century, mid 16th century, until the time of the independence, right? We became independent uh, from uh, Spain uh, in in the year 1821. And uh, of course we uh, became, you know, uh, uh, we consolidated uh, the the, the temperament we have, you know, the culture we have after that period, right? Um, But the colonial period, which is very long, is a time of, Amazing constructions in Lima, amazing architecture. Lots of the architecture of Lima emulated Europe, especially Spain, right? Uh, And Lima initially was very tiny, very, very small. But um, the the convent uh, that we just saw, the one uh, I was mentioning, was located far away from the city center, right? So that convent was started to be built in the year 1595, right? Uh, this um, promenade, uh, or uh, we call it Alameda, and Alameda is like a boulevard, right? Uh, inaugurated in 1611, mm, uh, was created to connect the city with the convent. It is a little bit funny because originally the Franciscans did not want it to be connected <laughs> with the city. That's the reason why they wanted to go away, right? But well, eventually, you know, the city grew bigger and bigger and well, it was impossible not to, not to create that connection. So the Franciscans went far away from the city center. Even they crossed a river. There was a river between the main square of Lima and this zone, right? And their intention was, complete isolation. So look at how beautiful it looks nowadays, by the way. This is how the um, the Alameda de los Descalzos or the Boulevard of the Shoeless, referring to the Franciscans, looks from above. Uh, all of this decoration you see in the Alameda is uh, the most like exclusive of the days when it was uh, built and also you know, the, the decades that came after because uh, the idea was to to make it look very nice, like with French, um, uh, say, uh, 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 v- these vessels you see here of uh, metal, they were French, the gates are English, uh, and there are monuments, statues, Italian, right? So the best of the best. Anyways, so when we get into the convent, and this part, by the way, we saw today uh, in, in our tour, uh, when we visited this this. Uh, convent. We saw this room, this section. Um, this part is known as the uh, claustro de la porteria. Oh, the cloister of the porteria will be uh, the door, the entrance. Uh, I don't know if there's an exact translation into English. I haven't found it. 
uh, but uh, it would be the receiver, uh, the, the zone of the visitors, right? So if you were not a Franciscan, you could visit up to here. Um, so in the colonial times, when you wanted to be a monk, when you embrace the life of a monk or could be a nun, for example, um, in theory, you would not cut completely your relations with your relatives, right? But the amounts of visits would be very, very few uh, per year, right? Depending on, on how uh, cloistered this convent you embrace was, right? Um, in the case of this zone, we know from the Franciscans that they were able to receive visits once a month, right? Uh, in this section, um, and also they were visited by doctors, no? so, uh, by an specialist, because um, this convent in particular, uh, in, in theory, is not considered a cloister, but it was in reality. The way how they call themselves is a recollection, recollection, uh, which pretty much is the same like cloister, was a place where they were isolated from the rest of the city, from the sounds of the city. They were dedicated just to God. But also this was a place where some people, some Franciscans were prepared to be missionaries. So not all of them were missionaries. Not all of them finally, you know, went to travel. Also, when the missionaries, when the missionaries, returned to the city and they were ill, they came to this place to be treated of their wounds or their diseases, right? So we're going to talk about this in a little while, right? Uh, in this section, uh, remember we are talking about Franciscans. So the Franciscans live a life uh, that was very simple, especially this group of Franciscans, because if we compare this monastery and the Franciscan monastery uh, of San Francisco, El Grande de Lima, which is the one two blocks away the main square, uh, the one of the catacombs, right? It's a completely different thing, my friends. It's different. And, and they are both Franciscans, right? The other one is much more ornamented, decorated. This one is way more simple, right? So we can see here frescoes or murals, is that right? right? I remember the um, today's guy we had here in the in this monastery, she said it was murals, murales, right? And these murals, they are uh, all decorated in some cases like vessels for flowers. This is, for example, the different colors that the walls had at some point, right? The deeper, you know, the, the, the more uh, clear the color, for example, in this section is the deeper, right? So we can see the different colors the walls had. Uh, so why? Well, um, they were not allowed to have too many uh, decorations in their cloisters. They did not have too many furnishings. So at the cloister of the entrance, at the entry clo cloister, uh, they painted decorations, they painted furnishings, they painted flowers. In, re in the reality, they did not have any of those. Huh? Um, so after that first cloister, what we have is the cloister of the guardian. Mm -hmm. And the cloister of the guardian uh, is the oldest cloister we have in this museum. This cloister was uh, inaugurated or, what, sorry, was started to be built in the year uh, 1595 right? Uh, and that means that also it started to be used a year after. That's what the museum also mentions. And uh, this was the place where the guardian or the leader or the director of the order uh, sleep and also uh, where he received important visitors. Notice also that not far away from the cloister we have these hills with um, these houses that are very modest. Um, the convent of the Franciscans is located in a district that is known to be a 
low-income, modest district. It is called Rimac District. So Rimac District is a very uh, humble, in general terms, district. Um, and that zone, the hill that is behind this construction, uh, is known as the first shanty town of Lima. Uh, but its location close to the hills also gives you an idea of how isolated this place used to be. Right. Sometimes in the year we have in the garden beautiful flowers of amancaes. This is the uh, local symbolic flower of Lima. Today we're able to see this flower and I invite you also to when we finish this event, uh, if you can visit Hago uh, Boyayers, our Facebook, where uh, well, uh, one of our friends, Christine, had shared some pictures from the earlier tour and there is the flower of Amancais too, which also in a, in a moment I'm going to be showing you in a picture too, right? But just to give you an idea of how beautiful also those pictures are. They, they were so well taken, by the way, by our boy here. So, well, uh, this uh, convent had, has also its own saint, Saint Francis Solanus or San Francisco Solano. And he was a missionary. Uh, he was a, a man born in Spain and he dedicated most of his active life of messenger of peace uh, and, and, and missionary, let's say, in the New World. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in Peru also uh, for a, a long period of, of his time, of his life, and um, he was the first guardian father of the order, right? So he also lived in this convent where uh, we are now. Uh, uh, during during this event virtually, right? So Francis of Solano, there's something very special about him, uh, the fact that he um, is known as a as a very um, good singer and musician. He used his voice and his music to approach to the indigenous, to the people that he wanted to convert, uh, and that's why also he's represented with a Ravel or a violin. Mm -hmm. uh, how were the Franciscans treating the indigenous population? Well, Michaela, to be honest, we have to say that uh, every religious order will try to do good to the um, indigenous communities, try to bring the best messages they could, but also they were the ones who introduced diseases to the indigenous. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the diseases who were introduced in the jungle, for example, in Peru, uh, were introduced by missionaries. Uh, and, and the missionaries, such as the Franciscans especially, were the ones who got deeper into the jungle. Right? In a hand also, well, we can say, thanks to them, we were able to learn a lot about the life in the jungle, even the languages that are spoken in the jungle. Many of them were very, very fluid also in the languages spoken in, in those faraway communities. But as I said before also, uh, there was not just a depredation of our, their own culture, uh, because we are talking about Catholic religion, uh, and, and, and they did not permit it, uh, other beliefs at the same time. The idea was saving the souls of the indigenous, right? Uh, so there was a complete depredation in some cases of the local cultures and traditions um, in order to assimilate them into the society they were bringing, right? Because they believe it was better. But also the other one is about the diseases, uh, the diseases which were uh, spread over uh, in the jungle in particular by the, uh, uh, by, the, by the missionaries like the Franciscans, right? Um, but also the Franciscans got diseases from the jungle. That's why it was necessary that uh, the, um, uh, for example, monasteries such as the one we are talking about had a nursery section to attend the missionaries that were ill, right? So once again, here a little bit more of Francis of Solano and the Ravel of Francis of Solano. Oh, so notice uh, this replica of how the Ravel used to be. The Ravel are uh, violins of three chords. 
and they are tiny. So he used to use this Ravel to call the attention of people in the plazas. And uh, I'm sure Francis Solano was a, uh, a man uh, that was in many ways unique, but also let's think about the many other monks, Franciscans or Dominicans who, who were trying to you know, do their work here in the new world, especially uh, it, like with this barrier, language barrier, right? So they had to use different ways to attract the indigenous. In this case, music could be one or art could be the other, right? Vanessa, in English, nurseries are from here. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank so much. Uh, nursing section. Oh, yes. Um, thank you, thank you, Liz. So nursing could be or uh, maybe the, because we have enfermería. So enfermería is for uh, treating the ill. So let me know if there is infirmary. Gracias, Liz. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to take notes on that. It was not so different than enfermería <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Liz. So uh, the infirmaries that we had in the uh, monasteries, they had to be very well equipped, right? So gracias, Liz. Thank you. And let's continue to this. Oh, this is a picture from the uh, flower of Amancaes, which is a amazing flower, golden, uh, lovely. And also it lives in conditions that are peculiar because we might think that most of the times flowers bloom when the sun is right, right? But in Lima, the flower of Amancaes it needs humidity, intense humidity for it to bloom. If it is too bright the sun, it cannot bloom. If it's not enough humid, it cannot bloom, right? So it's a particular flower that grows in these territories, very, very humid uh, during winter. Hmm? So also let's talk about um, the, the visitors that usually the convents receive. Hmm? And, and this uh, monastery is uh, also special because um, let's think uh, of this place as a uh, retreat zone for the upper class Limanians that were looking for isolation from the noises of the city, right? So these retreat spaces were uh, zones where the benefactors of the order could come to find asylum, to find a place where they could pray, maybe if they were mourning someone they loved very much. So in here, they could find courage to keep going ahead. So this room is one site next to the uh, cloister of the, um, of the guardian, um, and it's, it's connected to the bedroom of the guardian. Uh, and in here is where the visitors met the guardian. Right. So let's say viceroys, uh, judges, so important people of Lima. Mm? Um, so oh, I think we have. Oh, yes. Sorry. I'm going to turn back here. So um, we're going also to see another section, no? which is the part where the uh, Franciscans used to uh, have a printing, uh, uh, a printing section. So they used to print documents of the time, right? For example, they used to print um, religious documents, uh, books, uh, for example, uh, for other orders. And eventually in more contemporary times, uh, little magazines uh, about the activities of the order, the missionaries in different parts of Peru, right? We have also a section where uh, there are some choir books. Also, the choir books are the, uh, the books where the music played by the choir in the church. Uh, it used to be kept. Uh, also, these are very, very big books, usually 30 kilograms weight. This one is an original one that is protected. Once open, you can see how it looks inside. They have about 40 of these uh, choir books protected in this 
section of the house, mm, which people can see uh, if, if uh, they have the, the lack of visiting this museum during a guided tour. Mm. And the next section is, of course, the, uh, we call it the infirmary cloister, claustro de la enfermería, right? So um, in the claustro de la enfermería is where the ill people of the house, the ill Franciscans were treated. It could be the Franciscans that live permanently here in this convent or the ones that were coming from their missions, the ones that were returning to the big city and before going to the main uh, cloisters of, of the the church of St. Francis that is two blocks away from the main square of Lima. They came first here to be treated and then after they returned to the other uh, convent, right? So here we have a series of plants of, uh, that were used in the old days uh, to treat some uh, illnesses. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them are still used nowadays uh, for like remedies like mint, for example. Of course, everybody uses mint in this moment if you have ill tummy, ill stomach. But also there were other med medicines that were uh, a little bit more difficult to be prepared. Right? But first, let's give a look to the chamber where the ill Franciscan would be treated. Oh. So um, remember that this convent was for many of these Franciscans a cloister convent because they did not leave this house. It was by choice, by decision that some of them preferred just to stay in this house and others of course that wanted to send the word of God uh, to far far away they would, of course, take the decision of become missionaries and go to other convents that were in other parts of the country. So there were many people that were very young, strong men who, who wanted to, you know, like uh, do their best to send the word of God. But sometimes when they returned from those trips, they were too ill. So they needed to be taken care of the best way possible, right? So uh, this is the condition how nowadays this chamber is located uh, within this uh, convent. This is part also of the touristic circuit. We have a uh, cama medica or let's say medical bed uh, uh, from that time. So exact way, original, uh, the, the one used to be used. Um, also, we have, for example, this is what we call, sorry for my finger, this is what we call a, a San Pedro. San Pedro is sort of like a, you know, a toilet uh, from those old days for, for people who wanted to, you know, go to the bathroom, couldn't go far, far away because there were other common spaces for the Franciscans uh, to use if they wanted to go to the bathroom. You know? So they had all the comforts also to be in this space without needing to go out. So this um, little hospital section, this infirmary had to be well equipped because these Franciscans did not leave these convents. We have also a um, sort of like uh, bath uh, section, right, so for bathing. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's in, in, in English this, oh, but this is for baños de asiento. Asiento is having a seat, so you could ha take a seat here and someone will, yeah, it could be cleaning, Harvey, thank you, thank you. So, and it was, you know, to be seated, right? So you were put seated there, asiento, right? And you could receive, you know, a, a proper clean, right? And this is called, by the way, is original. It is in the uh, in this room, and uh, well, it, it is, a, they say, is of a person who was, uh, who died here in the convent, and they discovered the skull in the garden while they were doing some fixing process, so they decided to keep it here uh, for, for protecting the, the house, so, so <laughs> very curious. And remember also that Francis of Assisi is represented always with a skull or most of the times with a skull. So also the connection of Francis of Assisi with the dead that he also befriend, he called sister of uh, the dead also and a good friend 
is also really interesting, no? like, a, like a challenging the fear for the dead, which is natural. So when we walk upstairs from this uh, infirmary section, from this section for the ill people uh, that were here in the infirmary, uh, they, uh, or, or we can go upstairs, let's say, through this corridor, and we come to this room. This room is the room of the nurse, right? Enfermero, the nurse man, right? So this enfermero, this nurse man, was the person who took care of the ill until his recovery or until he passes away. So uh, the hospitals in the old days had a completely different function than the ones uh, uh, nowadays how we see them now uh, in, in these days. Gracias, Larry. Thanks for your tip support, my friend. Muchas gracias. And this is because uh, nowadays we go to the hospital to get better, right? So we don't go thinking we're going to die. We go to the doctor to get better, right? To be treated and to return home. But in the old days, going to a hospital, going to an infirmary was most, most of the cases for dying good, dying, you know, in the company of God or in the company of the representatives of God, which were the monks or the nuns, right? So it was a completely different idea about the, the hospitals then and now, right? Uh, and also something very curious. When we move, mm -hmm, when we move in direction from the chamber of the uh, guardian uh, nurse, right? And we open the doors, we can get to see this. Hmm? Oh, as I understand it, often they were only medical care. Uh, yes, that's right, Liz. Yes. yes. So uh, in, the, in the old days, you know, the, the idea of recovering from an illness, uh, it, it was not something, you know, that it was so common. Oh, uh, uh, but you went to a hospital to die in the hands of God, right? Look at this, you know, uh, uh, section, right? So um, this is the high choir of the chapel of El Carmen, uh, the Virgin of Carmen, right? And uh, this chapel is inside the, uh, the convent. Mm? So if you were very sick and you couldn't attend Mass, so the idea was, or you could be carried to the high choir to see the mass, or the doors could be open and you could hear from your bed the chantics and, well, the whole ceremony of the mass. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, although, well, the, the windows don't permit us to see this in detail, but the inside of this room is very dramatic it's very dark this is a well because that was in part the idea of the baroque style right lots of dramatism right but also uh, in order to diminish even more the external light into this room it was used um stone a type of a stone mm, uh, that was sort of like a marble right, that was polished very fine uh, to use it to cover like the windows, no? but instead of glass, right, so uh, this was a way also to diminish the external lights and control it inside. Mm -hmm. And here we have another section which is next to the, uh, the, the infirmary, we have the botica, which is the pharmacy. And the botica, which is also part of the circuit, has lots of the medical compounds, like chemicals, that were used to uh, treat diseases. Oh. So during your life in a convent, you could do different jobs, different works, uh, if, if you wish. You could dedicate to prayers only, or you could dedicate to the garden, or uh, you could dedicate to also learn uh, to to use all uh, these components and maybe a helper of the of the um, pharma 
pharmaceutical helper, let's say, here in the pharmacy, right? But these Franciscans were not doctors. So if someone was ill, they had to call a doctor from the city that would come and would use these chemicals, you know, these, these medical compounds, uh, will even in this section uh, that is separated by doors, this is the rebotica or the space uh, where uh, the, the compounds will be mixed, right? Uh, the recipes will be followed, right, to create medicine, right? So um, the, the, the doctor would come here to this space to prepare the medication and to treat the patient. Uh, also, this space that had so many medicines, I think next one, I guess you can see some bottles that even have already some um, medical compound, components. Um, so for example, if someone was ill in the city, uh, in the city center and needed some medication, they could come to this convent and ask for a specific medication, right? So that's also why this place is called uh, a recollection or recollection because first of all we had here uh, we gather uh, different kinds of medicines for example here in the pharmacy uh, that could be also used by people outside the convent if needed uh, also this was a recollection of um, let's say missionaries right that were preparing to go away a recollection uh, of the very Franciscans that stayed cloister inside that did not leave, a recollection uh, of, of products, of foods, right? <laughs> because there were many people uh, that uh, brought uh, products for the Franciscans to stay here, that the ones that could not leave, right? Uh, we have also beautiful altarpieces in the, in the convent, uh, like for example, this one here is again, the one of the chapel inside the convent, the one we saw also from the distance, from the second floor. Mm -hmm. And here we have a uh, picture of a, a cloister that is very beautiful, that has been recently painted in the fashion you see over here. This is the cloister Ayacuchano. Ayacucho is a a department of Peru in the south of Peru that um, produces beautiful uh, handcraft made, for example, retablos or uh, these nativity sets which are painted in uh, with flowers, painted with uh, different elements from the nature. And the fathers accepted to decorate this cloister in this same style, like all colorful, all uh, bright. Oh, so this is the Altar Ayacuchano. Uh, so uh, the life within the convents uh, back in the old days must have been really interesting and very active. Oh? Uh, well, waking up very early in the morning with the first rays of the sun, possibly, you know, praying in several locations in the day uh, and also uh, being able to uh, participate actively uh, in some cases in, in curing people that were sick, for example, people that had leprosy, they were at some point treated here by the Franciscans. And the idea of treating people with leprosy is also very, very much connected with the very life of St. Francis of Assisi because he himself treated uh, and, and even kissed the wounds of, of lepers no? and ate with them in a time when everybody feared leprosy, right? So the Franciscans, as an ultimate sign of uh, embracing the lifestyle of Francis of Assisi, they also did the same. Um, but also, let's think about the people that were not, uh, just give me a second before we do this, uh, that about the people that were not really um, in love of, of the life in the comments. So you could escape from from, uh, for example, a marriage you didn't want, uh, like going to a convent, or if you were a, a woman, for example, most likely if you uh, had a, an affair with a person your family did not accept it, uh, like to be your husband, and, and you even maybe got pregnant, you could be sent to a convent. Um, so 
I can imagine that life was very hard for, for people that did not really want to do what their parents uh, wanted them to do. So usually the escape was a convent or the punishment was a convent. There were many people that ended up in convents just to escape from, from their realities. Um, also, that takes me to a really interesting story. Uh, St. Rose of Lima, which uh, she is the first female saint of America. She was Peruvian. She was from Lima City, from my city. St. Rose of Lima, she didn't want to live in a, in a nunnery. She didn't want to live in a, in a convent, in a female convent. Uh, she preferred to live in her house, uh, and she asked her parents to build a little, uh, we call ermita, which is a little room, well, very, very small room, where there was just one bed, one little bed uh, in the garden, so she could live there uh, and, and just pray there in isolation. But she didn't want it to go to a nunnery. Why? It is supposed like in the nunneries you had, you know, like the isolation and you were close to God. Well, not in reality, because there were many people also in the, in the comments that did not live a very sane life. Remember that it was a punishment for many, many women to go to a nunnery. And if you were looking to have a, a very sane life, at least in the colonial times, not always you will find it in a nunnery. So she, she wanted to stay away from that, from that contamination at some point and uh, prefer to stay in the house of her parents taken care by her parents and live there in isolation and in a very close contact with God in the in the way she she felt it was best so well this is a little bit of, of how you know also uh, was lived this this life uh, within the convents uh, uh, and also well through these pictures I hope you were able to uh, to understand how was life in a convent, in a Franciscan convent in this case during the colonial times. Also today, well, I bought a book, which I'm going to possibly be doing maybe a part two of this uh, event. Uh, so this book, I bought it in the convent of the Shoeless, which is it's a tiny book. <laughs> and we're going to possibly be revising this book with you in another event. Uh, so if you would like to know more about what I do here in Lima and my virtual tours here, uh, let me invite you to uh, follow my social medias. Here you have a uh, picture of all my social medias, my Facebook group, my Instagram, Facebook, YouTube channel. Uh, you can also check out my upcoming uh, Hago uh, tours, uh, like clicking uh, in, in or, or type in the link over here or if you don't follow me yet in the upper part you're going to find a button that says follow so if you if you would like to uh, please follow my my channel and also I invite you to come to my next event that is going to be in a couple of days about a hot topic the Chinese revolution in Peru during the war of the Pacific this is going to be a really intense uh, talk because this story, gracias de Ana, thank you, thank you, thanks for your tip support. This topic, not even Peruvians know nowadays, like is a very interesting uh, story, this one of the Chinese revolution, the revolution of the coolies, coolies uh, in Peru that turned their back completely to Peru, even though they were in Peruvian territory, and fought side by side with the Chileans during the war with Chile, the war of the Pacific. So this is going to be a really hot topic. I hope you come to my next event. Um, thank you so much, Liz. Gracias, Peggy. Thanks for your support. And very soon we're going back again, the cloister of the uh, the, the shoeless, uh, the, the convent of the shoeless. So uh, to see the part two of the tour we started today, right? So muchas gracias, amigos. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. If you would like to support uh, my channel, to support uh, also Hago, and you don't know how, let me activate a button over there. So if you click there, you're going to uh, receive information of how you can give a little donation to, to help uh, my channel, to help Hago, to continue while keeping this platform 
free to watch, free to join. Uh, and, and well, actually, this is the best way to learn about the world uh, by virtual travels. So, muchas gracias, amigos. Take care. Best to you all. Muchas gracias. And see you soon. Until the next time. Bye-bye. Gracias. Gracias, Liz. Thank you. Bye-bye.